Well, I'm recording. Are you recording? I'm recording. Yep. Okay. Are you comfy? You happy? I'm about to get real comfy. You get comfy. Cool. Cool. Yeah, sweet. All right. Welcome to Wired AF. Oh, do you want to do the intro? I'll do the intro. Yeah. Welcome to Wired AF. This is your host, Steph and Brandon. Today, we're going to be talking about lower back pain. What is it? What are the common things that we see? Uh, what exercise can you do for it? Should you get scans? All these kind of questions. Should you we're rest gonna, for two weeks? Should you rest for two weeks? All these things we're going to talk about um, and basically debunk and let you guys know all about it. So Steph, is lower back pain or, or is that a common thing that you see at the clinic or that you see people come in or complain about? Yeah, super common. So pretty much the most common things we see is neck injuries and lower back injuries um, or people coming in with pain through their lower back. For people that don't know, I'm an osteopath, uh, recently started practicing this year and lower back injuries, super, super common. Something like 70% of the population will have lower back pain at some point in their lives. Um, so it is really, really common. I did a blog post about it. It's yeah. the most non-communicable non -communicable disease ever or most prevalent. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, most people will come in just saying, oh, my back hurts. Uh, I picked something up off the ground uh, and then I just threw my back out or I was training at the gym and then I hurt my back or um, I was sitting down for a really long time in the car or at work and now my back's hurting. Um, usually it's nothing super serious. So Before we go any further, yeah. you can't throw your back out. <laughs> no, it's, right? not like, it's not like the, the joints are actually like completely out of – they're not like out of place and in different spots. They might not be moving correctly and they might be slightly misaligned, but not to the point that like you've got one vertebrae over there and one vertebrae over the other side. It doesn't happen. No, that's not, that's not like a thing. Like, yes, you can have misalignment and they're not exactly um, in perfect harmony with each other, uh, but, yeah, you're not going to, you know – break something just from lifting something up off the floor and sometimes it's also a matter of the joints not working together so like the connection between the hip and the knee or the connection between the foot and the hip uh, and stuff like that and that's usually more of the problem and the back's actually in a lot of people quite strong and that's why it gets tired and sore and we often find that the back in some people you know that it actually is the is the symptom and a lot of people are kind of getting better at understanding well you know my back sore but it's probably not my back it's probably something else and some people you know at least my members are getting mm. uh, more in tune with their body and they they know that it's the symptom but not the cause of the problem but the general population is also maybe still a little bit behind with that and going oh my back sore it's broken yeah, exactly. What you said about the symptom is exactly, exactly a really good, important, really good, really important point. Uh, do we like my English there? Cl clearly having a moment. But yeah, like, you know, you've got to look at the feet and as an osteopath, we'll look at your feet, your knees, your hips, um, your whole spine and how everything's moving. So if you have one area that's overworked, so say, for example, you're sitting down too much. If you're sitting down too much, then your hip flexors are going to be tighter than they should be and your hips might be slightly out of alignment and then there's more stress through your lower back than ideally what we would want. Often as well, you'll get more movement in other areas. So for example, maybe like your mid back, your thoracics might have more movement. Um, so then your lower back is a little bit stiffer. It doesn't do as much movement. Um, so generally you're gonna find there's lots of different findings. It's not like it's just one thing that's feeling painful um, or one thing that's a problem. It's lots of things together and we're looking at the body as a unit and how it's working together to basically get this back pain like which is the symptom like you said so so yeah. what are some of the strategies that you employ or that you use in order to help people move a little bit better through their back assuming the context um is like quite basic someone that's usually quite sedentary is usually i guess a good cause of the back pain yeah so i guess the first thing that we'll i'll usually do is make sure that people understand what their pain is um, so we've spoken before about pain on this podcast and injuries and what you can do about it but it's important to educate people about what their pain means so for example just because you've hurt your back um, and you're feeling the most excruciating pain ever it doesn't mean that there's a huge amount of damage to the the area or to the tissues so the amount of pain that you feel is not equivalent to the amount of damage that has occurred so so in, on the flip side, you might not feel any pain at all and you might have, um, you know, you might have a bulge disc in your back um, or you might have a bulge disc and you might feel uh, 
lots of pain. So you just, it, it's not relative, you know, the damage that you've done is not relative to the pain that you feel. So that's an important thing to understand. And we need to educate people on that um, and make sure that they understand that as well. And also making sure that people aren't getting into fear avoidance behaviors where they want to basically not do a movement that they think might be painful um, for the fear of the pain or for the fear of making the injury worse. We really want to encourage movement. So I always try and encourage people to move, especially those sedentary people if they're sitting down a lot at work. I try and think of ways that they can maybe move a little bit more at work. So a sit to stand desk is really great or getting up once every hour, you know, even if it's just for five minutes um, to walk, you know, down to get a drink of water or to go to the bathroom, like simple strategies like that to get people up and movement is going to be really beneficial. And then also educating them on exercise as well. And if they can regularly exercise, that's going to really help them. Yeah, you made a good point and something that you've always said and I hear you say is pain is an experience. And it's so true because everyone's uh, experience or their level of pain is different and then and like you said that's not an indication of how much pain you're in so mm. it can be counterproductive to kind of tell someone to rest two weeks uh, because that is just gonna make the joints not move where the potentially for a lot of people the reason why they're not the, the reason why they're in pain is because they're not moving yeah. uh, and that you know motion is lotion yep. and something that you've said in the yep. previous podcast <laughs> and it's it reigns true because if you can increase movement, you're likely to, you know, get your pelvis to go through those ranges and, and it will open up and free up and then it should hopefully help, you know, your knee or your ankle or yeah. subsequently if you get your foot to do some different things, then it can help your knee and your hip. Yeah, exactly. And I think the other thing too is like a lot of people get really worried when they hear the they hear the word or the diagnosis of having a disc bulge or having a facet sprain or something like that. They get really, really concerned. And the thing is that your body is a really marvelous thing. It can actually heal itself if you allow it to if you you know move your body and you're eating properly and you're sleeping properly um, and you're giving yourself the best opportunity and you have a positive attitude you're giving yourself the best opportunity for your body to heal itself and it will heal itself so if you have a disc bulge from 10 years ago it's quite likely that that's actually that's healed you know your body usually these kinds of injuries they do heal within three to six months three months is usually like the maximum sometimes they do linger a little bit longer if you've pushed yourself a little bit more and you haven't kind of monitored your exercise or you haven't like done what you should do to make it feel better but injuries do heal and they they will heal regardless of whether you get treatment or not um, but often people think that an injury is still hanging around 10 years later when no, that injury is it's healed. It's just that maybe you're sensitized in that area or you think that your pain experience is still there. Which is so real. Yeah, your pain experience is real. I'm not saying it's not real, but the actual injury has, has healed. So I think understanding that as well is a key principle. Um, we're obviously touching on some things that, it, that we can go a little bit deeper into it if we wanted to, but as long as you sort of understand that, that your body will heal itself, um, then that's really important too. And you don't need to be afraid of movement or afraid of exercises. I think if you can really encourage yourself to get back into movement within reason, then that's going to be one of the best ways forward rather than just sitting and taking a passive approach where you kind of don't do anything and you, you know, expect that just resting for two weeks is going to help, which it's not. We'll get to treatment in just a moment, but yeah. I find two things that can be counterproductive to someone's recovery can often be, like you mentioned, you touched on the medical jargon that people use, and then the second one is imaging. So yeah. uh, I guess for a lot of people, if you get a scan and it says, okay, you have um, degeneration in your spine uh, and you have a certain, like, you know, a grade one, two or three, say, strain in the ligament or there's, there's something like that, and people, and, you know, there's the medical term like the full name of the muscle mm. is there uh, and it might be a muscle you never heard of that you, mm. that you didn't know you had and it can be really, really intimidating and you can freak out not yep. knowing what the hell... But really, uh, that translates to, um, you know, you've got a normal amount of wear for your age or in your back uh, and so on. And, you know, you've touched on it before and we've spoken about this before, how imaging is not always the best answer, especially, you know, considering the context, but mm. if someone's just got a sore back and, you know, there aren't many red flags and you don't need imaging, sometimes you're going to find things that everyone's going to have. I'm sure there's plenty of degeneration in my back yeah. or, or, you know, in everyone's back. Yeah. And I'm sure if you scan a seven-year-old woman who has no back pain, there'll be plenty of exactly. arthritis or potentially in her yeah. back. It could be. And it's not like, you know, 
you're human after all, you're not a robot. Yeah, exactly. Just because you get a scan does like it doesn't always mean it doesn't mean that the treatment's usually gonna be any different, like you said, unless there is a red flag that we're we're concerned about. So when someone does come in and they've got back pain, I'll always ask them, have you had any bowel or platter changes? Do you get pain when you go to the toilet? Do you get pain on coughing and sneezing? Um are you noticing any sort of blood in your urine or stool? Things like that is something we're concerned about or numbness and tingling down both legs or weakness down both legs. So usually if you've got all of those things, then we're a little bit more worried. Um, but that's when we would send you off to get a scan right away or refer to, you, to your GP. But if you, know, if you haven't had any bowel or bladder changes, you don't have any... Um, sensory changes down your legs. The scary things. Yeah, the scary things. You don't have any weakness down your legs, um, something that's hanging around, you know, then you, you don't really need to be too concerned. It, it's If it's any of those really serious things, by please, by all means, go and see a doctor. Um, but we'll, we'll ask those questions anyway to, to screen for red flags. Or if, you know, you already have underlying medical conditions, like say if you've already got cancer or you've already got diabetes or you've got some other conditions that might affect your recovery or affect what what's going on, then then yes, like that might make things a little bit more serious. But usually with your back pain, yeah, you um you don't always need to get imaging. At the time I would give someone, get imaging for someone is if they've had this back pain for, you know, maybe a couple of months and they're doing everything that we've spoken about. They're exercising, they've got a positive attitude, they're getting, you know, regular treatments to check in on how they're going and they're really like trying their best to make things better and their back just isn't getting any better. If it's absolutely not getting any better at all after a couple of months, then yes, we might go in to look for, um, do some imaging. Or if we're suspecting that there's a fracture um, or if there was like a traumatic event, like you were in a, a motor vehicle accident. So something like that, then yes, we would get imaging. But if it's just like your everyday kind of person coming in, oh, I feel like I hurt my back at the gym if it's start, if it's getting better within a couple of weeks, then I, I probably won't get imaging. And the other thing too, it's expensive. It can be expensive. If you're getting an MRI and you're paying for that on your own back, that's like three hundred bucks. Yeah, three hundred to five hundred. Yeah, depending like you on where said, you go. Yeah, and like you said, you know, you might you might find something and then you get worried because you see the word degeneration, and it's like, well, hang on. If you had have scanned you six months ago, you probably still would have found degeneration, but you didn't have any pain. So it, you got to kind of like weigh up. Like that's what we do as a health professional is weigh it up whether it's worth it or not for the patient um so yeah I, I you don't need to go out willy-nilly and get scans all the time yeah awesome and so that's something that you do really well is always keep diagnosing so yeah. you'll if you know you implement something you want to know if that uh what you've implemented works yeah and to see if you've given someone an exercise or you've recommended they do something to mm-hmm. see if when you see them next time if it's working exactly yeah so now we'll move on to some treatment and some things that yeah. are really, really good for, I guess, uh, back pain and stuff like that. So yep. one thing that I think was really good in uh, lockdown for our members was Pilates or Pilates mm. style movements and how, you know, with no equipment, you can do quite a lot and you can regress them quite a lot. So this is something that's really important with rehab and getting someone back to moving is mm. experiencing the least amount of pain in the movement as possible. And Pilates, you can regress the exercise to so yeah. many different levels as you can also progress it but there's obviously a quite a basic way to do everything like for example a hip raise you can just lay on the on your stomach and squeeze your bum exactly and that can be <laughs> as simple yep. as you can make it yeah and you can obviously build it up to something yeah. else from there so when we're recommending exercise um for people the research is saying that any exercise is better than no exercise for lower back pain and that's one of the best things that you can do so any exercise pilates definitely is very popular the great thing about pilates is that we tie in principles of breathing with movement and you're also really focusing on your alignment and body awareness which I think is really great so that's why it's so great is because you can move your own body weight it's very accessible to a lot of people to do it at home you don't need equipment you can just do mat pilates and you can get really good activation of certain muscles and good stretching of muscles as well Um, and like we spoke about body awareness and breathing which are all really great things Um, but you know if that's not for you you could just go for a walk and like that's fine too you could go for a swim and that's fine too like any exercise that you enjoy that's um, pain free or within you know it's not super uncomfortable with your pain is going to be excellent like if you're just doing um, squats at home sitting your bum down on a couch and standing up again that's going to be better than nothing so uh, any exercise is great but definitely Pilates um, I'm a big big advocate for obviously because I have taught Pilates for the last five years so I believe in it I think it works and I think it's really great for a lot of people 
something that goes over a lot of people's heads is walking. Yeah. And now a lot of people that just do weights and just sit down all day and have another job or say they have a job and they just lift weights uh, and they come to the gym and then they get sore. It's probably because you only do weights and you don't do anything else. So you're only exposing yourself to one type of movement, squatting up and down, picking mm. a weight up and down. Um, you know, we do some rotation in the classes, but not much, uh, not as much as we probably should. But the reality is walking is something of like one of the best, or yeah. is the best thing you can do yep. because your body, your pelvis will have to shift so many positions in order just to take two steps. Your upper body rotates as your hips rotate the opposite side when you move your foot in front of you. Yep. And... Um, it's something that goes over a lot of people said people think they're too good for walking it's just how the fitness industry is probably like demonized <laughs> you know uh, hit hit workouts are like what you need and you yeah. know it's kind of like uh walking is like you know eating a balanced diet and running and all the other <laughs> bullshit is like uh keto and low carbs and all that <laughs> other stuff it's like people think they're, they're too good for it yeah. in a certain way or they're too good for it so you know with walking it's the the movement is so basic and yeah. anyone can do it at any yeah. level usually pain free mm-hmm. and it's the best thing you can do you know your mm-hmm. hips will move and it will start to open up and that's something that's really important for yeah. everyone uh, especially lower back pain exactly yeah and you know if you're struggling with walking on different surfaces like start in the pool walking in the pool because the water takes out some of the weight of your body then you can start on like a soft surface so even like a running track the surface is really nice and cushiony, so that's a really good surface to walk on. Grass is good, it's a little bit more uneven. Asphalt's quite firm, so you know you, you may want to wait before walking on asphalt, but consider those different surfaces. Walking on sand is amazing. Um, so yeah, like walking is really underrated. Like I go for walks all the time, I love it. I use it for recovery and I feel really good. Um, yeah. yeah it's so just, often, often we just find people yeah. that are lifting all the time, they just don't do it. They just don't participate in anything else other than lifting. And I used to have that attitude as well um, where I would not walk or not do Mm. anything because I worry it will tire me (laughs) out. Uh, And that's so stupid. So (laughs) don't be like that. Don't be lazy. Uh, Actually move your body. And um, yeah, it's something that's so important to do. Building on that. Mm -hmm. um, What was I going to say? Well, I have a point about uh, lifting weights at the gym. People people get really worried. So I, I feel like... The exercise that's demonized the most for lower back pain is deadlifts. So I just want to quickly say it's it's not the deadlifts that are hurting your back. It might be your technique or it might be uh, the load or it might be that your body's just not that conditioned. Um, It's probably not the actual deadlift, like the movement. It might be lots of other factors around the deadlift. So like you can easily change a deadlift to um, just the barbell. It doesn't have to be heavy. You can change the range. It doesn't have to be from the floor. It can be from your knee. Uh, You can easily change this movement it doesn't even have to be with a bar it can be with a kettlebell you've got to remember that deadlift is a very functional movement it's picking something up off the floor and standing up again which we all do in daily life all the time if if you're not going to do deadlifts then you're pretty much saying you're not going to pick things up off the ground (laughs) yeah so like I, i think we need to get away from the demonizing deadlift argument because it's just not it's just not really that legitimate anymore like you 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 can demonize something else but you don't need to demonize deadlifts just you know check your form check the load check your recovering make sure you're eating enough you're sleeping properly um very often like people think that it was a deadlift that did it but it could be it could have been so many other things around that deadlift like maybe you sit at work all day um and you never stretch and you don't sleep you know you only sleep five hours a night well it was probably all those things that were contributing to it as well uh it wasn't just the deadlift so that's just something to think about. Yeah. <laughs> what was I going to say? I don't know, Brandon. What were you going to say? I'm Another ready. really simple thing is footwear. Yep. So I find that people's shoes and stuff like that. So Steph, you had a really good experience with yeah. Stephen, the podiatrist. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So I saw this podiatrist. Um, when was it? It was probably two months ago now. I was getting really sore feet and like I've had knee and back issues as well in the past. And I saw this podiatrist, Stephen, he works in Eltham. Um, What's the clinic called? Uh, Eltham Physiotherapy Centre. So shout Center. out to Eltham Physiotherapy Centre. Yeah, and Stephen, and what's his? Do you know Stephen his McMurray? Oh, yeah, done. he's a podiatrist. He's really great, and uh, he basically told me to get better footwear. He said my footwear was, you know, it sucks, and I was Abismal. like, yep, it, it it is. It's got no support. So I went to the Athletes Foot as he recommended, and they recommended footwear. They tested my feet, and my walking, and where I put my pressure, and uh, what my arches are like, and got these new shoes and. 
that was it. Like I went back to see What shoes did you get? I got ASICs. They were ASICs Nimbus something. They're black with uh, rose gold details. They look really good. <laughs> something that I find <laughs> But yeah, they work so good. Yeah. Another thing that people skimp out on is footwear or yep. maybe they don't skimp out on it, but it looks, okay, ASICs don't look the best. <laughs> I'm looking at mine now. I'm like, oh, no, geez. They look, these look like a dad shoe. <laughs> they do. But, them, but that's okay. I don't really care because they're really good. Yep. And I know as soon as I wear Nikes, the Nike ones look better, but they're so bad. Um, <laughs> maybe the kids that make the ASICs are a little bit older, so they it's, they look... They, <laughs> to cut that video. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, and something that people overlook. So something like footwear... You're going to be in it all day. Yeah. Now, um, we recently uh, worked something like that out for another client of ours who has some arthritis in his knee. Mm-hmm. And Steph, you were talking to him about what footwear does he have? Yeah. And he had some really old Nike Metcons, which are really flat and I have no support. Great for if you're going to be doing some kind of lifting, but even then I think barefoot would be better anyway. Uh, so then we recommended he get some different shoes. And I think he got the same thing. I think he went to Athletes Wood and got some Asics. Yeah. And no knee pain now yeah. it could be a lot to do with um the shoe because of the position that his feet mm-hmm. are, in, they yep. are in uh and it could just be you know maybe he, he was he placing some rehab more pressure. Ex- he has some rehab exercises as well yep. um so you know it can be so many things but yeah combination footwear all is that. really important so consider that check out athlete's foot if you want to go in and get your feet tested because they're really great there i can highly recommend them So then the last thing is obviously maybe exercising barefoot as well. Mm, So something that we've been finding works really well, especially women who wear heels Mm. and their feet and toes are really compressed all the time in the shoe. And then when they have to squat or anything like that, their feet kind of aren't really moving and doing what they need to do when they squat. So then uh, it just becomes a lot harder for them to get into a squat and, you know, their hips don't really move as well Mm. as they should. So as soon as I find I get people to go barefoot, it's a completely different movement. Barefoot deadlifts, barefoot squats, uh, the exercise is so much better and yep. they're able to push a lot easier through their feet and have a lot more pressure mm-hmm. uh, in through the in through the arch of their foot and have a lot more power yep. rather than loading up the outside of their foot so much. Yep. And I find that's something that is, again, overlooked. So if you're yeah. going to the gym and you're deadlifting with ASICs, maybe not the best idea or deadlifting with really old shoes, uh, maybe just try and de- deadlift barefoot mm. and you might find you have a lot more power and it might just feel a lot better for your back. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, if you do have any back pain and you're, you're not really sure where to start, like, by all means, see a health professional, you know, just even if it's something really minor and you're not really sure what's going on, like, feel free to go and see an osteo, physio, chiro, whatever you prefer. I'm... Um, I obviously am biased towards osteo because I am an osteo, but I have nothing against physios or chiros as well. Uh, They do a great job too. So feel free to see someone that you trust um, and just keep in mind the points that we've spoken about, you know, like you want to take an active approach to your recovery and you might get flare ups in your back if if you're training sometimes, but consider that maybe it wasn't a particular movement that did it. It could have been a variety of factors. You could have been really tired that day. You could have been really stressed. You might not be recovering well. Maybe you need to stretch more. Maybe need to do some more activation exercises or try some more walking check out your footwear all these kinds of different things are going to play a part so yeah feel free to uh, talk to a health professional about it or you can reach out to me on instagram as well <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's fine too i was if you waiting have any for the shameless plug the shameless plug yeah, you can uh, come and come and see me i'm working out a gateway osteo uh, if anyone does want to come and get a treatment from me so I'm there four times a week. <laughs> Treatment and rehab plans as yep, well. So something that I'm really big on and just to finish is just moving through different um, range of motion or yes. just um, doing some rotation or different planes of motion if you believe in the triplanar model, which is the three planes of movement. But, you know, everything is pretty much rotation anyway, no matter how you look at it because joints have to rotate anyway, uh, no matter what plane you go through. But uh, not to get too far away from what I was trying to say <laughs> was that maybe if you're deadlift and you're only picking the weights up off the floor, maybe your back sore because you're only experiencing one plane. Maybe you should do some wood chops. Maybe you should resist rotation by um, doing uh, a banded um, pelof press yep. with the band or there's plenty of exercises that we can do. Um, mm. But rotation is something that is definitely uh, underappreciated. You know, just throwing the wall ball um, to the wall. Yesterday I finished my session and I was just kind of throwing the wall ball to the wall uh, and catching it. And I was doing, and I was just moving my body through a position where mm. I normally would kind of like be really stiff and guarded. Where did you get these ideas from? Uh, just been, just been trying to do. Like my dad's got. I'm looking at it now. Uh, he's got this sledge. 
uh, yeah. Sledgehammer. Oh yeah, the black one, it the Dom made. Yeah. yeah, and and honestly, yeah. you know, having an, a unilateral weight, having a weight yeah. on one side, doing a you know a suitcase deadlift where yeah. you only hold on one side. We do a lot of unilateral work where we only have one weight in one hand. We yeah. do like a single arm kettlebell thruster um, or a single a single leg deadlift mm. and stuff like that, and that can be really good yeah. um, just for loading your body up in different positions yeah. and, and getting your body to go through different ranges of motion rather than always doing um, banded hip thrust. Yeah. Uh, and stuff like that, which, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's so what they I'm have saying. a place, but yeah, no, you're a hundred percent right. You know, like we've, I've been working with you on your rehab for the last few years and Olympic weightlifting is a very linear sport. So, uh, you know, you literally move up and down, but you're resisting rotation when you're trying to catch the weight and balance a certain way. So it would make sense that you'd want to move your body into rotation. So it knows what to do when it experiences that. So that's why we sort of brought in wood choppers in your program. But yeah, exactly. You know, even any joint you want to move in lots of different ways. People get worried about internal rotation through their hips and knees within reason, you know, give it a go. Like try some. Oh, hundred percent. You in, have to internally rotate your, course, you, should, yeah. you should be able to move do a squat body. with yeah. your knees caving in yep. uh, because you know, you want that strength in that area because chances are when you go yep. down and pick something up, your knees probably cave in anyway. Yep. You wouldn't like push your knees out yeah. to that point anyway you know obviously um, there's an optimal position for certain movements for and everyone certain there's an technique, optimal position. but we're just encouraging you i guess to explore different movements um especially with just your own body weight because you know it's just your body weight like you move it every day so you should be okay to move it and yeah awesome now we just finished this podcast but next one coming up is the atomic habits Yes. So, are you finished the audio book? No, nearly. I okay. don't have much to go. That's right. I'm doing good. I read, I read it really quickly. It I was know. Really you easy are on read. a roll. I yeah, tell I'm, you what. I'm killing it. Yeah, <laughs> you really are. So proud of you. You and your little reading goals know, this year. I know. I, yeah. I'm not buying any more books. No, you've got um, enough. <laughs> apart from the ones that I have on order at the moment. <laughs> no, what? You got no, more? <laughs> no. Well, they just they, they weren't they didn't dispatch. They were out of stock. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, so yeah. that's going to be really cool. Yeah. Now will be cool because not all the things I agreed in with the book so it'll make a great discussion mm. um, but there were some awesome things and a book like that without examples is pretty meaningless so there were some awesome examples yeah. that um, James Clear the author gave mm. and it's going to be really interesting for us to kind of you know go into that and yep. you guys really like The Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker which was our last book club episode and we obviously said we were going to do a bunch of them this year yep. so hopefully you guys are looking forward to Atomic Habits so that can pretty much be next week or whenever we do it. In but the next coming weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be soon. Stay be tuned. Soon. Yeah, not as much of a build up as the <laughs> sleep book because <laughs> I've already read it. So yeah. it should be fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and no, then, yeah, we also have the following book club episode, which is Eat Like the Animals. So if you haven't already found that book and purchased it or your. Um, you stole it from the library or you are listening to audiobook and you've got Audible and you get like a free book for that month, maybe check out Eat Like the Animals. But it's a really good read and everyone's going to love that. So it's going to be cool. So those are the two we've got coming up. Yeah. Uh, I think that's all we have to share. That is about it. Great. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Brandon and I'm joined by... Steph. <laughs> See you guys next week.